This video is a thrilling compilation of eight of the most intense and powerful tank battles that Yarnhub has covered. If you have been with us from the beginning, you'll have seen that we've improved a ton over the years. Many will say that our earlier animation is substandard. We prefer to call it classic or vintage. In this, our first compilation, we pit eight of our favorites. If you're seeing this on the premiere, we'll try and answer as many questions as possible that come up on the chat. If not, please put any questions you have in the comments and we'll try and answer them as soon as possible. Now, prepare to witness the raw strength and firepower of these impressive armored vehicles as they engage in fierce combat on the battlefield. And let us know if you see the cat. It's August the 22nd, 1917, World War I, and an attack is underway near Ypres. Supporting the British infantry are several of the new cutting-edge Mark IV tanks. The battlefield is covered in mud and pitted with craters. One of the tanks, named Frey Bentos, is slowly advancing. Walking alongside his tank is Captain Donald Richardson. In the open, under fire, he communicates directions to the driver who has terrible visibility to navigate the treacherous terrain. The advancing Frey Bentos manages to take out the German machine gun, and there's a cheer inside the tank as they lumber towards more of the German guns. Still outside the tank, under heavy fire now, Richardson is hit in the leg. Unable to continue leading the tank, he is forced to retreat back inside Frey Bentos. With all the crew inside now, the driver, George Hill, is hit and falls out of his seat. The tank trundles on with no one steering. Realizing the danger, Richardson tries to grab the controls, but it's too late and the tank veers and slides down into a deep crater. The Mark IV jolts to a halt, stuck fast in the mud of Passchendaele. The crew of nine are now trapped in the middle of no man's land during one of the most ferocious battles of the war. Surrounded by Germans, their actions and their tank will become legend. Sergeant Robert Misson and Lance Corporal Ernest Brady step outside to see what they can do and, if possible, release the unditching gear. Mark IV tanks carried a large beam covered in sheet metal that could be attached to the tracks and dragged underneath the tank to get it unstuck. While working, they hear the sounds of bullets on armor. The Germans aren't just close, they're 30 yards away. Misson dashes back inside Frey Bentos, narrowly escaping the hail of fire. Lance Corporal Brady isn't so lucky. He's on the other side of the tank, working to attach the unditching beam. Caught by enemy fire, he falls in the mud, never to rise. Inside the Mark IV is cramped and hot, but that's the least of their worries. The crew must contend with a constant stream of bullets, bombs and heavy artillery. Unfortunately for them, they are also at the risk of friendly fire. The men are sitting in a high-tech gold mine, the Mark IV offers better protection than most of the technology at the time. The tank was a recent military development in warfare, and the Allies would rather blow the crew out of the mud than gift a secret weapon to the Kaiser. To make matters even worse, the main tank guns are at the wrong angle and can't be used to blast the Germans. So, the men must rely on whatever's around weapons-wise to fight back. A grim situation, lightened just a little by the name of the tank, Frey Bentos. Captain Richardson named his Mark IV after a brand of canned meat that was popular at the time. Meat surrounded by metal. An ironic joke to inspire the men in time of war. The Germans push their attack and a soldier manages somehow to get a grenade into the tank itself. After what must have been a heart-stopping few seconds, the crew grab the grenade and toss it out again. Incredibly, the men are holding off the Germans with only their handheld weapons. Metal bounces off the tank during these fierce exchanges, injuring the crew further. Of the eight brave souls that remain, seven have been injured by shrapnel. How much longer can they withstand not only the German onslaught, but shelling from their own side? The hours pass as this extraordinary standoff continues. The hours then turn into days of heavy fighting, with the Germans attacking and the plucky crew forcing them back again and again. As the days dragged on, they were forced to drink water from the radiator. Desperately hot by day, 
and exhausted and freezing by night, the Frey Bentos boys spent an agonizing three days and two nights repelling the enemy. Completely exhausted and realizing that no help was ever going to come, they had to finally face the fact that they were on their own, and that if they were to stand a chance of survival, they were going to have to make it across No Man's Land. Crossing No Man's Land was a deadly undertaking and the crew knew that the British infantry would shoot anything moving coming from the German positions. Richardson decided the best bet was for the men to leave the Mark IV one at a time, starting with Sergeant Misson. He had the most dangerous job of all, crawling across the British lines in order to warn them not to open fire. His body stiff and aching, Misson ran the gauntlet, sliding on his belly through the mud of Passchendaele, bullets and explosions falling all around him. He was a sitting, or rather crawling duck for anyone with an itchy trigger finger. After many close calls, covered in mud, he managed to get close enough to shout to the British lines and warn them he was on their side. Once he'd made it across and warned the British not to open fire, it was the turn of Captain Richardson and the surviving crew to start the perilous crossing. They elected to drag their Lewis guns along for the trip, so they wouldn't be seized by the enemy. To their relief, they made it over the lines and were finally out from under the Germans. The Passchendaele campaign had started in late July and wouldn't end until November. Thankfully, the Frey Bentos boys were free from the carnage, though they'd endured a gruelling 60 hours in a situation so perilous it's difficult to imagine. Captain Richardson and his team received medals for gallantry. The military cross went to Richardson and Hill. Misson and Morrie were awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Arthur's Binley, Budd and Hayton were given the military medal. This made them the most decorated tank crew of World War I, an honor they richly deserved. We wouldn't know the details of this astonishing story of courage under fire, were it not for a discovery made in 2017. The Tank Museum in England holds archives of those serving in World War I, and to their surprise, they discovered in their archives Sergeant Misson's personal written account of what took place. One of the more attention-grabbing pieces you can see there is a protective mask made partly from chainmail, designed to repel shrapnel. There's also a Mark IV tank on display so visitors can get up close to the legendary vehicle itself. After a short recovery, Captain Richardson went back to the front and continued the fight. He climbed aboard another tank and rolled into the Battle of Cambrai. Its name? The Frey Bentos II. It's May the 16th, 1940, two hours before sunrise. 13 German tanks from the 8th Panzer Regiment are taking their positions. Partially obscuring the Panzers behind toppled walls and collapsed buildings is central to the Nazi plan, and now the trap is nearly set. From their vantage points, battle-hardened commanders will have clear views of the road leading into the beleaguered northern French town of Ston, just a few kilometers south of the Belgian border their main guns loaded with high-velocity armor-piercing shells. For German crews, it's only a matter of time before the French tanks lumber into view and they can get on with the turkey shoot. Crumbling under the Nazi juggernaut, France's future is bleak. Hopelessly outnumbered, armored units have done little to halt the Wehrmacht's relentless advance. But in Ston, the roles are about to be reversed. Hundreds of yards away, a sharp B-1 bis heavy tank from the 1st Company, 41st Tank Battalion, appears around the bend. In the commander's seat is 34-year-old Captain Pierre Biot, son of French 1st Army General Gaston Biot. Nicknamed Eure after a river in Normandy, the sharp B-1 bis is a massive 30-ton brute. Featuring thick, heavily sloped armor, tank and crew are nearly impervious to most German guns unless fired from close range. And the French tank has another big advantage. It has two guns to the Panzer's one. The first, a 75mm tank killer in the hull. The second, a 47mm cannon in the small turret operated by the commander himself, also capable of punching holes in the lightly armored Panzers. Spying the German tanks through his sight, Biot springs into action. Barking commands, the 75's loader slams around into the breach as the gunner lines up the crosshairs at a panzer downrange. 
In the turret, Biot follows suit. Now, cannons loaded, orders to fire slice through the morning air in French and German. Deafening cracks and blinding muzzle flashes erupt from both sides. Anti-tank rounds traveling faster than the speed of sound whistle past one another towards targets of steel. Then, in the chaos, the tanks nearest to and farthest from the Shah B-1 take direct hits and burst into flames. Taking out the first and last vehicles in a formation is a time-tested tactic, and as a result, the 11 remaining panzers are now hemmed in. Shocked at their comrades' fate, German gunners fire ceaselessly, but though the Panzer IV 75mm guns are powerful enough to penetrate the Shah's armor at close range, they're too far away. Closing the distance is an option, but doing so will put them in even more danger, and for the Panzer III's, things are even worse. With either 37 or 50mm main guns, they're impotent from almost any distance against the Shah's 60mm frontal armor. The Germans realize that they may as well be armed with slingshots. Despite the dire situation, dozens of rounds slam into the Shah's hull and turret, but to the Germans' consternation, they do little damage. Some deform the armor plating, others shear off bits of steel, but the rounds are deflecting off the tank and not penetrating into it like they're supposed to. Inside the already hot and smoke-filled Shah, the impacting shells are making a deafening commotion, like the tank has been set upon by sledgehammer-wielding guerrillas. Thankfully, it's nothing Biot and crew can't handle. In fact, they're just hitting their stride. Load, aim, fire. Load, aim, fire. The Shah's twin cannons thunder away and the German tanks keep going up in flames. Columns of fire and oily smoke pour from the stricken panzer's hatches as the rounds inside cook off. Checking for more targets but finding none, Biot realizes with a start that they've taken out every German tank, all 13 of them. Not one to bask in recent successes, he orders the driver to turn the tank towards the town to join the fighting there. By the end of the day, Biot and his crew and their now famous Shah B-1 Biss have taken out even more German tanks and a number of artillery pieces. Other Shahs have arrived too, and though German forces remain in the area, they lack anything powerful enough to dispatch the Gallic steel beasts, and by nightfall, Ston is back in French control. In the following days, Ston changed hands nearly 20 times before eventually falling to the Nazis. The Shah's legendary ability to take and dish out punishment did serious damage to the confidence of the German tankers. The 10th Panzer Division War Diary recorded that they had encountered 60-ton super-heavy tanks, an over-exaggeration, but an indication of the fear the Shah B-1 struck into the invaders. Many Shahs were captured and used by the Germans when Germany still had nearly four dozen of them in service. Biot was taken prisoner after France fell, but this French hero could not be contained and escaped the following year. Awarded the Légion d'honneur, he lived a long and active career and died on June the 29th, 1992. It's the 20th of August, 1941, and the crew of a tank in position outside the small town of Novi Uchkoz are woken by a stream of Ju-88 bombers flying overhead. The bombers are on their way to attack Leningrad, but the concern of senior lieutenant Zinovi Kolobanov is not on the German planes. His job is to stop the advance of the panzer divisions that are now pushing through the Russian countryside. Kolobanov's weapon is the Soviet KV-1 tank. With a 76mm gun and thick armor, at this stage in the war, it's superior to the Panzerkampfwagen 35Ts and the Panzer IVs that the enemy is fielding today. Kolobanov has prepared the ambush well. In total, there are five KV-1s rammed full of armor-piercing shells and arranged in positions overlooking the roads. Kolobanov's tank, number 864, is dug in so that just the heavily armored turret covered in brush is poking above the ground. The gun faces towards a long road, upon which either side is swamp. At the end of the road is a turn, so any approaching tanks will need to slow down to make the turn. 
This is where Kolobanov's gun is aimed. He's also hoping that any defense the Germans put up will be no use as he has the high ground. It's the perfect trap. Around 2 p.m., there's a buzzing in the distance and several German motorcycle scouts come along the road. But the Russians are after bigger fish today. The motorcycles get to the end of the road and turn left towards Marienburg, unhindered. Then there is a rumble and the unmistakable noise of tank tracks. The main German force comes into view. Inside the KV-1, the gunner looks through his scope and starts counting the line and counting and counting. It's a huge line of 22 tanks and two anti-tank guns. The numbers are huge, but fortunately, the Russian crew are relieved to find at least there are no heavy tanks snaking along the road today. The road is now full of German machinery, and the lead tank gets to the end of the road and slows down for the turn. Kolobanov signals to his gunner, Andrei Usov. The work is about to begin. Usov readies himself in the tense moments before the battle begins, and then lets loose his first of many shots on that fateful day. There's a boom, and the tank jerks back under the recoil as a 76mm armor-piercing round flies across the Russian countryside and rips into the Lee Panzer. It's a critical hit. The Germans are dumbfounded. Was it a mine or something else? The tanks start to bunch together as they stop boxing each other in. Then another boom as the second tank is hit. The third shot also hits the second tank, destroying it. Now the Germans know they're being attacked. They signal to try and back up the rear of the column, but Kolobanov and Usov are there before them. Targeting the last tank, there's another shot as the KV-1 lets loose another armor-piercing round that tears into the rear panzer. To be sure the head and the tail of the snake is immobilized, yet another round is sent into the rear panzer as it goes up in flames. The Germans realize they're trapped. Now they desperately try and figure out where the shots are coming from. Either side of the road are several haystacks which are targeted by the Germans, who mistakenly think that they're hiding Russian defenders. Then a chicken farm in the distance receives heavy fire. Another panzer is taken out and they realize with dread that the shots are coming from a rise in the distance. Many of the panzers that aren't blocked in scatter off the road, all the while receiving fire from Kolobanov. But soon, their thin tracks get them bogged down in the swampy ground. Targeting the rise in the distance, the panzers start the return fire. Inside the KV-1, there is a resounding clang as the turret is hit. But in this case, the Russian bias is the real deal, as the super-thick armor of the KV-1's turret is more than a match for the undergunned German tanks. Then there's another hit on the turret, and another, as the Germans get their eye in on the target. Between hits, Usov lets fly more anti-tank rounds. The Germans start to get the anti-tank guns into play, but they too are soon dispatched by Kolobanov and his gunner. Under the hail of fire in the KV-1, the gunner's scope is hit. Now, unable to target the Germans, the tank commander ordered the driver to reverse out of the hiding spot. Once clear, the radio operator, Kiselkov, was sent outside to replace the scope. The scope was replaced, but under the heavy fire, the turret was damaged and unable to rotate. That didn't stop the crew of 864, as they now use the tank's steering to adjust the aim, and their grim work continued. Initially, the turret was hit many times for each shot it managed to get off, but as the battle slogged on, the hits on 864 lessened. When 864 finally ran out of ammunition, 22 German tanks and two anti-tank guns had been destroyed by Kolobanov. Kolobanov radioed to the other tanks. Up to now, he had given orders to the other tanks that they should not fire so as to not give away the position and size of the force that the Germans were facing. But now, it was their turn, and a boom resounded as a fresh KV-1 joined the fray. Finally, the total tally on that day was 43 German tanks destroyed, for not even one Russian tank. That isn't to say that 864 got out unscathed. Examining their tank after the battle, the crew counted 156 hits on their trusty KV-1, although none penetrated the armor. The road still exists today, 
and its name, translated to English, is Tank Alley. It's June 1944, Normandy, and the 3rd Armoured Division landed Omaha White Beach near Assigny in France. Riding on top of his Sherman is Texan tank commander Lafayette G. Poole. His crew have been training hard and have yet to see battle, but this aggressive young staff sergeant trusts a bunch of misfits he commands. He calls them his pups. The men have named him War Daddy. They have been sent to take on the Germans near the commune of Villers-Fossard. His Sherman is called In the Mood. Ready for battle, the mood of Commander Poole and his crew are far from the easy tunes of Glenn Miller. At six foot three, it's cramped for the giant Texan inside the tank. That's why he likes the fresh air on his face, sticking up out of the Sherman turret like a cowboy on a beast of iron. They are in the 32nd Armour Regiment, 3rd Armoured Division, who were nicknamed the Third Herd. The fighting is tough, but he's riding in with some of the best. In his own words, he describes his crew. My driver was PFC Wilbert Richards, five foot four at full attention. We called him Baby. He could have parallel parked that big Sherman in downtown New York in rush hour traffic. Then Corporal Burt, schoolboy close, just 17 years old, still with peach fuzz on his gentle face, co-driver and machine gunner to the stars. Dal Boggs, my loader, had been arrested on manslaughter charges. The court gave him the choice of prison or the military. What could we call him but jailbird? Corporal Willis Oller was my gunner. I often bragged that he could shoot the eyebrows off a gnat at 1,500 yards with our 76mm gun. The imprint of Tanker's goggles permanently stained his face. We never referred to him by any other name but Groundhog. The In The Mood found itself at the front of a spearhead. We'd like to thank Richard Cutland, ex-Royal Tank Regiment and currently working for Wargaming, and the excellent podcast, The Finest Half Hour, in explaining the spearhead. The term Armoured Spearhead as the name suggests, was given to the tanks that formed the front of the offensive, first into contact and first to receive enemy fire. In simple terms, a way to lay effective concentrated fire onto the objective and in theory, quickly overwhelm the enemy. The assault was usually followed up by supporting infantry on foot, whom critically also covered the flanks. However, all this depended on the tactical situation and the terrain. Tanks in the spearhead on terrain that had lots of obstructions prime enemy targets. Tanks had limited situational awareness and without the infantry were susceptible to things like anti-tank guns. It's a risky tactic if done incorrectly, with the potential of an enemy counter-attack, particularly into the infantry-supported flanks, a constant threat. Only the bravest wanted to be at the forefront of the spearhead and Lafayette G. Paul and his men showed true courage in doing this repeatedly. A German soldier undercover readies a Panzerfaust Translated into English, tank fist. Like its name suggests, it's a devastating anti-tank weapon and it's aimed directly at in the mood. A crack of thunder and a puff of smoke. The shout goes up, incoming mail, and a colossal impact rocks the tank, leaving ears ringing and nerves jangling. It's enough to put the Sherman out of action. Paul and his men escape. They had a good, if short, run of six days between the 23rd of June and the 29th, but it's far from the end of their story. Shortly after, they're back inside another Sherman, the In The Mood 2. On August the 7th, Paul and his men roll into the Battle of the Falaise Pocket, part of the legendary Operation Overlord. With German forces encircled by the Allies, Paul is in Fromental village, central France, pushing German troops out of the picture. He's right up to the front of the spearhead, just as he likes it. Driving a wedge into the Germans, he gets on the radio and jokingly says, ain't got the heart to kill him. Those listening in hear the machine gun fire, followed by him shouting, Watch the bastards run! Give it to him close! In the midst of battle, Paul is at the front, mopping up the Germans when explosions rock the In the Mood, and it's clear he's being bombed. The tank is destroyed and the men scramble out. The most likely reason is this was due to a friendly fire incident involving a Lockheed P-38 Lightning. Paul famously had a short temper and boxed with a great right hook, so the flyboy responsible was wise to keep his head down. The crew, two tanks down but undefeated, take charge of yet another Sherman. You can probably guess what it was called, but it's not a case of third time lucky. 
Moving into Belgium, another panther is about to cross paths with Commander Paul's rolling powerhouse. In the Mood 3 has just destroyed several enemy personnel carriers and returned to find a panther attacking the column head. Groundhog lets slip the dogs of war from the 76mm barrel and they chalk up another panther for the long list of victories. It seems like nothing can stop them while they're all working together as a team. Heading up a column, making for the Siegfried line, this key defensive line has to be busted open. And if anyone's gonna do it, it's no-nonsense Texas boy, Lafayette G. Paul and his men. Pushing towards the line, they come face to face with a panther tank, which blasts them at close range, twice. In the mood three, dodges the attack, and Groundhog gets the enemy in his sights. He takes a shot, it's only one strike, but is it powerful enough to breach the armor? There's a huge explosion inside and the turret flies off under the pressure. As they push forward, Jailbird needs to have his ears checked and is temporarily replaced by private first class, Paul King. In Munsterbusch, a town to the far west of Germany, the Germans have tried to conceal a gun inside a house. Seasoned military man Paul is wise to the ambush and spots the danger. He orders his loader to prepare to fire. The stand-in, Private First Class Paul King, jams the gun. By all accounts, Paul's words that day are, Back up, baby! The next sound is a huge explosion. The panther is struck. Paul is blown onto the ground where his right leg crumples. King has been killed. In an extraordinary display of wartime grit, Paul gives himself an anaesthetic with morphine and begins removing his damaged leg with nothing more than a pocket knife. Unaware of this gruesome development, the rest of the crew try and get their bearings. The panther tries again at the Sherman as it tries to reverse out of harm's way. At the edge of the ditch, In the Mood 3 turns over, bringing an end to Paul's short-lived but incredible career as a tank case. Over the 81 days they rode those three Shermans, Paul and his crew took out more than a thousand enemy soldiers. 12 tanks in total felt the wrath of the In the Mood, with 258 armored vehicles adding to the tally of destruction. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the Legion of Merit, the Silver Star, the Purple Heart, the Fourager, and the Legion of Honor. Paul returned to Texas, got a prosthetic leg, and rejoined the army as an instructor before retiring in 1960. If you like this video, please comment and share. Please also consider supporting us on Patreon so we can make more videos like this. If you would like to find out more about Paul, we strongly recommend checking out the 3rd Armored Division site. Thanks again to Richard Cutland from Wargaming. You can hear more from Richard on the excellent podcasts Tank Nuts and The Finest Half Hour. It's the early morning of June the 13th, 1944, in the French town of Villers-Bocage, south of Normandy. Civilians line the town streets, celebrating the arrival of the British soldiers. They hail them as liberators, gifting the rank-and-file men fresh produce in gratitude. It's a welcoming and uplifting sight. But little do the people know, the soldiers are performing a flanking maneuver behind enemy lines. The town is far from safe. Just outside the town, hidden in the bushes lining the many fields, a beast stalks its prey. A tiger tank of the second company of the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion. Standing atop its cupola is the most decorated German panzer ace in history, Leutnant Michael Wittmann. Wittmann looks on at the line of British armor and infantry, half-tracks, Cromwells, fireflies, and towed artillery, all moving up the highway. They're taking position at a hill just beyond the town. Their advance had caught him completely by surprise and thoroughly unprepared. His 15-tank company is down to 12 tanks, and they've had so many mechanical problems, only two are ready for immediate combat. But Wittmann feels his hands are tied. The British must have already seen him, and if they haven't, it's but a matter of time. Weighing his options, he retreats inside the tiger's turret and makes a very simple order. Judge! The tiger roars to life, bursting out of the bushes and racing towards the British forces. By sheer chance, an NCO in a half-track witnesses the pouncing tiger and shouts over the radio, for Christ's sake, get a move on, 
There's a tiger running alongside us 50 yards away. But it's too late. The tiger crashes into the scene, emerging onto the highway behind the station troops. Fitman's machine turns its turret and immediately fires upon a parked Cromwell tank, destroying it with a single devastating hit from its mighty gun. The British panic and run every which way. A Sherman Firefly starts to turn towards Wittmann. It's the only machine present capable of posing a danger to the German heavy tank. But it's facing the completely wrong way. Wittmann's expert loader is quicker than that vehicle can ever hope to turn. A muzzle flash lights up the highway and the 88mm shell pierces the side of the Firefly. In the blink of an eye, it's reduced to a piece of flaming scrap blocking the highway. The second operational Tiger arrives mere moments later from the opposite end of the hill, spreading further panic. The British forces are in total disarray as this new adversary opens up on the field of parked war machines. Meanwhile, Wittmann decides to take the fight into town, leaving the hill to his ally. The Tiger turns away from the ongoing battle and drives down the road towards villers Bocage. Half-tracks line the road, abandoned by their crews the moment the battle started. Wittmann systematically destroys them, the Tiger unleashing devastation with machine gun and high explosive shells, leaving behind a column of flames and mangled debris. Barreling down now towards the town, he sees three Mark V Stuart tanks blocking his path. To his surprise, they don't run, and instead, the lead Stuart turns to block the road, as the rest fire at Wittmann with shells from their tiny guns. They bounce off Wittmann and his crew fire. without any effect. In response, the Tiger crew fires at the lead Stuart without hesitation, swiftly destroying it. The Tiger's sights then turn to the left Stuart, and it too is dealt with in a single brutal shot from the mighty 88. The ensuing explosion fires the little tank's turret sky high. The third and last fares much the same. The Tiger then rams the blocking Stuart off the road and carries his rampage into town. He sees a half-track and swiftly takes it out with a high explosive shell. Immediately upon entering, he spots a Cromwell backing away between the houses to the left. Wittmann gives the command and the gunner fires at it from point-blank range. They keep moving and a second Cromwell is spotted up ahead. It fires and its 75mm shell ricochets off the German armor with a deafening clang. Desperate, the crew of the Cromwell fire a smoke canister, but it flies past overhead as the unstoppable Tiger turns its 88mm weapon upon them. In a flash, the Tiger shoots the Cromwell, piercing it with ease and setting off a fire. Somehow, the crew members survive the impact and hastily stagger out of the machine. Wittmann orders to fire the machine gun upon the survivors, who are taking cover behind their wrecked machine. Third Cromwell, commanded by Captain Pat Dias, quickly flees the scene. His gunner hadn't returned when the chaos broke, so he's unable to fire. So he orders his tank into a farm's garden and takes cover behind a barn. Wittmann's Tiger rolls past his position, miraculously failing to spot him. As soon as it rolls past, Dias's gunner emerges from his cover and rejoins the crew. Now fully operational, Dias and his crew bravely give chase. Meanwhile, Wittmann comes across two observation post tanks parked on the side of the road, an unarmed Sherman and yet another Cromwell. He swiftly destroys them both and keeps moving down the road when a Sherman Firefly peeks around the corner at the end of the town. It fires and the Firefly's shell slams against the armor of the Tiger. Somehow, it doesn't pierce and the Tiger crew desperately attempt to turn the vehicle's heavy turret. The Firefly fires three more times, but none manage to penetrate. The Tiger fires in haste and it too misses its mark. It strikes the side of the building and the entire corner collapses down onto the Firefly below. Aware now of how far he's gone, Wittmann decides it's time to get out of there. He orders the tank around and they retreat back from where they came. At the same time, 
Dias is coming down the road with his Cromwell, believing he's about to surprise the tiger from behind. But his hopes turn to horror when through the heavy smoke of burning machines, he sees the tiger emerge, staring straight towards him. Dias orders, shoot, and the gunner fires at the enemy head on, but the Cromwell stands no chance. The shell ricochets and the tiger rolls ominously to a halt. Dias's crew manage to fire one more time, but it's just as useless. The tiger returns fire. Its shell goes straight through the Cromwell's turret, killing the gunner and loader. Dias, on the opposite side of the turret, miraculously survives and hurriedly crawls out of the machine along with the driver. Wittmann then orders his tank off the road, hoping to avoid any further encounters and retreat for once. They burst through the fences as they make their way behind the home. Back at the highway, a British anti-tank crew runs out of cover. They scour the line of wrecked half-tracks and find one of the towed anti-tank weapons that are still serviceable. They aim it towards the town, waiting for the German war machine to return. Believing that he'd already bypassed any survivors, Wittmann orders his tank back onto the highway to rejoin his squadron up at the hill, inadvertently wandering right into the crosshairs of the British. In a display of incredible discipline, the gunners don't fire right away, and they take a handful of seconds to carefully aim for the tracks. In a flash, the six-pounder shell flies across the road and slams straight into the tiger's sprocket wheel, immobilizing it. The crew of the anti-tank gun instantly bolt for cover as the tiger's turret starts to turn. Inside, Wittmann and his crew feel a bang and then a sudden stop as their running gear comes undone. They hurriedly scan the area for the enemy, but they're long gone. Wittmann stays in place for 20 long minutes, turning the turret around and firing at anything that seems to move. But now he knows the situation is untenable and he orders the crew right. to bail out. Let's get out of here. They jump out of their tank to no resistance, only surrounded by the distant sounds of battle taking place in the hill ahead. Altogether, the crew flee into the countryside. The battle would drag on for a whole day, with the British forces surrounded on the hill, facing the brunt of it. More German units join the fray, including one led by Wittmann himself, returning at the helm of a Panzer IV battle group. The British attempted in vain to relieve the hill, they fought valiantly, performing much better once reorganized, but their position behind enemy lines and the initial surprise attack left them vulnerable. In the end, the Allied forces would retreat back to their proper lines and the surviving soldiers on the hill were taken prisoner. Michael Wittmann would be promoted to Hauptsturmführer and awarded swords to his Knight's Cross. The tale would be exaggerated by the German propaganda machine and he became a household name. We tried to pull together a narrative for these events that have been drawn from several sources, but many accounts conflict. No doubt, there are errors in our film today. It's the early morning of July the 18th, 1944. Lieutenant John Reginald Gorman of the 5th Guards Armoured Brigade is riding on board the Ballyragged, one of two Sherman tanks under his command near the village of Cagny in the north of France. They are late to the battle. Broken radio transmissions speak of fierce combat ahead as they race past wounded soldiers, field ambulances and burning tanks lining the road. Moments later, he finds part of his squadron taking fire over a ridge and a fellow lieutenant wildly gesturing them forward. Gorman can see the urgency of the situation and orders his driver to charge up the hill towards a tall hedge at the top, taller than the turret of the Sherman. They follow the hedge until it comes to an end right before a road. They round the corner and what meets them makes Gorman's blood run cold. A king tiger, Germany's monster tank sitting out in the open 300 yards away. He would later write in his book about the encounter, it was horror personified. With armor capable of shrugging off shells of all but the heaviest of Allied weaponry and the infamous Flak 88 as its main gun, it was capable of destroying an Allied tank from one and a half miles away. It's a force to be reckoned with, and it isn't alone. Alongside it, there is a Tiger I, yet another formidable tank, and a Panther, and a Panzer IV. 
Outnumbered and outgunned, John Gorman has to think fast. None of the German tanks have spotted him yet, and the King Tiger is aiming in a completely different direction. Gorman knows that if he has to do anything, it had to be now. Determined to take down the King Tiger, but knowing that the gun of his Sherman is near useless against it, Gorman turns to his driver and orders, ram it. Corporal James Barron stomps on the accelerator and the bally ragged lunges forward. It smashes through the hedge and begins picking up speed as they accelerate downhill. The crew hold on to whatever they can as the Sherman races down the slope, shaking and bouncing violently with every rock and bump on the hillside. Albert Scholz, the gunner, keeps his eye on the sight. They are approaching fast. Scholz opens fire and hits the side of the King Tiger's turret with a high explosive round from point-blank range. A split second later, the 35-ton Sherman slams into the side of the King Tiger with enough force to crack the welds of the Tiger. Without skipping a beat, Gorman gathers himself and shouts, Bail out! He opens the hatch above him and jumps out of the now immobile Sherman. He sees the shocked and disoriented crew of the King Tiger doing the same. They leave the tank to the sound of firing guns and distant explosions. They're now in the middle of an open field on foot, surrounded by enemy tanks, with nothing but the wreckage of the two tanks for cover. Right at that moment, Gorman's second Sherman, commanded by Sergeant Harbinson, peeks over the same ridge and draws the attention of the remaining three German tanks. Gorman, sensing the opportunity, runs across the open field, followed by his crew. They hear the deafening bang of the Tiger One's main gun behind them. Its shell flies overhead and strikes Harbinson's Sherman square in the front. The tank bursts into flames. Assuming the worst, Gorman runs past the wreck and takes shelter in a cornfield with his crew. He would later write, my feelings at our first action were certainly not of triumph. They were more that it was a job only half done. Gorman tells his crew to stay where they are and runs back for reinforcements. Reaching the road, he spots what seems to be an abandoned Sherman Firefly. Climbing aboard and opening the hatch, inside he finds the body of Sergeant Workman, the commander of the Firefly. However, the rest of the crew are unharmed apart from being in a state of shock. With their help, he pulls the body of the commander out of the tank and takes his place and orders the driver to drive back into battle, an order which the driver obeys without hesitation. The Firefly is a powerful beast, created by the British to better counter German armor with its 17-pounder gun. It's perfect to finish what they started. Directing the Firefly to the top of the hill, Gorman orders the driver to gently push through the hedge, just enough to lower it so the turret can peek through and have a good view of the battlefield below. They see the Tiger I, Panther, and Panzer IV, still in the same positions from before, along with the abandoned Bally Ragged and the King Tiger. The Germans are swarming over the stricken tanks, and Gorman realizes the value that both of the abandoned tanks have for them. So he turns to his gunner and orders him to destroy them. The gunner takes aim and fires the gun. The Firefly rocks backward violently and their vision is blocked by the blinding muzzle flash. The shell goes high and hits the dirt behind the King Tiger. The gunner is visibly shaking but tries again. Firing another shot, this one hits right on its flank and the King Tiger bursts into flames. The loader slams another armor-piercing shell into the breach as the gunner brings the reticle over to the bally ragged. Again taking aim, he fires. This time the shell punches right through the Sherman's armor and ignites the ammunition inside. The explosions of course get the attention of the remaining three panzers which begin turning their turrets towards Gorman. He orders the driver to reverse into cover and they disappear behind the hedge, mere moments before the panzers get their chance to unleash hell upon them. Gorman and the crew of the Firefly relocate under the cover of the hedge before peeking back out. Once again, they push down the hedge to reveal the panzers on the other side. The German armor and their crews are taking heavy fire from other tanks of the Irish Guards Division and are beginning to retreat into nearby buildings. 
Gorman seizes the opportunity and orders the gunner to fire at the Tiger I. The recoil once again rocks the tank. Dust and leaves fly around the tank from the sheer power of the gun and heavy smoke fills the cabin. The shell streaks across the battlefield and falls just short of its target, exploding on the ground and firing up a cloud of dirt into the air. Another, Gorman orders. The gunner adjusts and fires. This time the shell hits right on the turret of the Tiger, but doesn't penetrate. They fire two more times, with one of the shells hitting the Tiger one in the turret, but once more, it proves to be ineffective. Realizing the element of surprise is now gone, Gorman orders them to withdraw and the Firefly disappears behind the hedge once again. Unsatisfied, Gorman is determined to try one more time, but as they are relocating, they come across the still burning wreckage of Sergeant Harbinson's tank and two individuals come out of cover, calling their attention. It's the turret crew. They had escaped the burning tank and pulled a severely injured Harbinson out of the flames. He had burns over his body and needed urgent medical attention. Gorman helps lift Harbinson to the engine deck of the Sherman and takes the men to the regimental aid post away from the battle. Sadly, Harbinson would die two weeks later from his injuries. The French town of Cagney was successfully captured that day by the 2nd Battalion Irish Guards. The rest of the crew of the Ballyragget survived and were picked up by a separate tank after the battle had ended. John Gorman was awarded the Military Cross and his driver, Corporal James Barron, was awarded the Military Medal for their bravery on that day. Gorman survived the war and lived a long and illustrious life, passing away in 2014, aged 91. It's March the 6th, 1945, in the German city of Cologne. Operation Lumberjack is underway. It's a big push to put a foothold up and down the west bank of the Rhine. The war is reaching its inevitable conclusion, but many Germans are still fighting on. Rising high over the city that's been devastated by Allied air missions, standing defiantly are the two towers of Cologne Cathedral. Far below from the lofty heights sits a menacing beast waiting in the shadows. Hidden in a tunnel near the train station is a panther tank lying in ambush. The 3rd Armored Division, Easy Company, have had a tough job to make it this far. The tanks and infantrymen, known as Doe's, have been going from street to street. The American tanks are mainly Shermans. American armor has been underperforming against the German armor. The German tankers joked, one German tank is better than 10 American tanks but the Americans always have 11. While having superior numbers, this mismatch in technology was denting the morale of the Sherman tank crews. The US answer is the T-26E3 Pershing tank. Still very new and somewhat under wraps, very few have been made, but one is operational in the center of Cologne today. It's a generation leap ahead in technology with a huge 90 millimeter cannon an automatic transmission and twice the effective armor of a Sherman. Two Shermans are tentatively heading down a narrow street called Commodianstrasse on their way to Cathedral Square. The street is blocked with fallen rubble from a collapsed building and the lead Sherman comes to a halt with the second coming alongside. The second lieutenant, Carl Kalner from Wisconsin, is in the turret of the lead tank. He's unable to find a way through the rubble and gets on the radio to call for a dozer tank to clear the path. Back in the shadows, within the Panther, the gunner has a clear shot. Vision is everything. 70% of the time, whoever fired first survived. And today, the lurking Panther has eyes on its prey. There's a green streak of a German tracer and the shell slams into the gun shield of Kellner's Sherman. There's a deep clang that reverberates around the streets, but the hole remained intact. But then, a second shot from the Panther hits the Sherman, overlapping with the first hit, and the tank is destroyed. The second Sherman, realizing the danger, slams into reverse, but the Panther has already got its second victim in its sights. Releasing another shell, the Panther hits the tank track, leaving the Sherman veering off to the left and grinding tracks. Desperately trying to avoid a deadly shot, the Sherman manages to limp behind a building and the crew evacuate. Kellner manages to get out of the tank, grabbing his rifle, but he's lost a leg. 
A medic and the surviving crew carry him to safety, but it's too late, and Kalna becomes another casualty on the closing chapters of the war. In the Panther, Bartleborth is standing tall in the turret. Having dispatched the two tanks, it emerges from its ambush position and trundles towards Kalna's smoking Sherman. Taking position in an intersection, the Panther now sits and waits for the next move in this deadly battle on Cologne streets. Approaching in a street parallel to the battle is Eagle 7, a Pershing. There's a shout outside and the tank commander, Bob Early, opens the hatch. On the street, combat cameraman Jim Bates tells Early that there's a monster of a tank guarding the cathedral and it can be seen around the corner. Jumping out, Early goes with Bates to have a look. Taking cover in a building, they see the monstrous panther sitting at the intersection, its gun still facing down Kamodienstrasse towards the Shermans. With its gun in that direction, Early realizes they can head up the parallel street and attack it from the side. He heads back to Eagle 7 to tell the crew the plan. Key to this is his gunner, Clarence Smoyer. Clarence has proven himself to be an excellent gunner, and in the brand new Pershing, his skill has saved his crew many times in the push across Germany. Bob Early's trust in Clarence's ability meant that he never had to wait for a command, but was authorized to take a shot whenever he thought he should. Back in the Panther, an uneasy feeling of premonition came over Bartleborf. He guessed the Americans may come from a different direction and directed his gunner to turn the turret to the right to face the currently empty street. Unaware of this development, Eagle 7 trundled forward to take out the monster tank. Clarence lowered the 15 and a half foot long barrel and turned it to the right, ready to take the shot as soon as they cleared the buildings. Shoot wherever you want, Early told Clarence. He's just sitting there like he owns the place. Already loaded with a 24 pound T-33 armor piercing shell and the loader, Don De Rigi, had another at the ready for a fast second shot. Woody McVeigh, the driver, gave Eagle 7 more gas and it picked up speed. The gun almost scraped the buildings as the crew held their breath. Clarence looked through the scope, waiting for the row of buildings to end. Don't miss, he thought to himself. As the Pershing emerged from the intersection, right into the path of the Panther's gun, the crew gasped in terror and McVeigh, in a panic, hit the gas as Eagle 7 came into full view of the Panther. All the crew could see was the black barrel of a German gun pointing right at them. Back inside the Panther, waiting for a Sherman to emerge, Bartleborf saw a tank dive into the intersection from the shadows. Green and heavily armored, it wasn't the American tank he was expecting. Realizing it wasn't a Sherman, in an instant he screamed to his gunner, Halt! It's one of ours! Clarence took aim. He knew he had to land the first shot and fired, and the T-33 shell zipped with an orange tracer towards the Panther. Slamming through the side armor, it took out the engine bay. Clarence's view was obscured by the dust kicked up, and he wasn't sure if he'd even made a hit. Behind the cloud of dust, the hatches on the Panther were thrown open and the surviving crew, including Bartleborth, escaped. Clarence took his second shot, hitting the turret. Hit, cried Early. With the gun still pointing at them, Clarence took a third shot. A fire broke out in the Panther as the ammunition cooked off. Realizing their job was done, they sat back, stunned and relieved. The crew of Eagle 7 counted their blessings. That was close, said Clarence. A few days after the battle, when some German children with their mother asked Clarence for sweets, he was explaining he had none, and the hero of the Battle of Cologne was reported for fraternization by the military police standing nearby. Early received a bronze star, but Clarence was never awarded for his actions, possibly due to the fraternization charge. That was until Adam Makos wrote the excellent book Spearhead, which chronicles Clarence's tank battles throughout the war. In 2019, in part due to the perseverance of Adam, Clarence Smoyer, aged 96, finally received his bronze star in recognition of his action in Cologne. Clarence now lives in Pennsylvania, we hope very much that he likes this film. It's the evening of August the 17th, 1950, near the city of Pusan in South Korea. 
Lieutenant Granville George G.G. Sweet of the 1st Platoon, Company A of the 1st Marine Tank Battalion, takes a moment to rest by the steel giants under his command. Around him is nothing but misery. UN forces have been pushed back from the moment they became involved, going from just south of Seoul to cornered against the sea in Busan in just a month. One of the biggest and most demoralizing problems has been surrounding armor. The North Koreans are equipped with Soviet T-34 85s. With its 85 mm cannon, it's easily capable of piercing the American Chaffees and Shermans, while only the Sherman can fight it effectively in return. And to make matters worse, they vastly outnumber the Shermans, meaning that most of the time, soldiers had to fight them with chaffees, bazookas, or no anti-tank weapons at all, giving the T-34-85s a fearsome reputation. But today, Sweet has a reason for optimism, for under him isn't a chaffee or a Sherman, but it's a late World War II M26 Pershing. His four-tank platoon has been fighting in the defense of Pusan, and they've performed brilliantly, but he's still to meet the tank that has been dominating the battlefield in the last month. Lieutenant Sweet's crews busy themselves hauling ammunition into their tanks as the sky turns orange with the sunset, when suddenly an urgent message arrives through the radio. Flash purple, flash purple. Those are code words for one thing, incoming enemy armor. Sweet springs into action, ordering his crew to prepare for combat. The men of the supply depot rush to finish the resupply job, dumping jerry cans into the Pershing's fuel tanks as fast as they can and spilling gasoline in their haste. Full! We're ready. Get moving. One after the other, the four Pershing's 18-liter V8s come to life with a deafening roar, rolling out to their first tank-on-tank -tank duel. On the battlefield, the men of the 1st Marine Provisional Brigade scramble to counter the enemy advance, taking positions on the barren hills lining the narrow dirt road, through which four T-34-85s trundle onward, followed by lines of infantry. The Marines open fire on the North Korean soldiers, who take cover in the hills. The T-34s fire back, continuing to advance as small arms fire bounces off their armor. Marine bazooka teams hurry to meet the charging armor. They open fire and strike the lead tank right on its external fuel tanks, bursting them open and lighting a massive fireball across the engine deck. But the tank is unharmed within, and its crew keeps pushing, uncaring of the flames engulfing the rear of their machine. Meanwhile, further along the road, Lieutenant Sweet is making his way towards the scene. They're close. They can hear gunshots, and Sweet is in constant update of the evolving situation. But then they stumble upon a pair of abandoned supply trucks right in the center of the road, blocking the path. The commander of the second tank in line, Technical Sergeant Cecil Fullerton, looks down at his gunner and orders him, keep your eyes ahead. If something rounds the bend, shoot it. He then climbs off his tank and hurries over to the abandoned vehicles, driving them off the road to open a space for the tanks to proceed. The tank convoy immediately gets back going again. Fullerton gets back in his tank and Sweet radios him. Sweet's tank has a problem with the elevation of the gun, so he orders Fullerton to take the lead. He'll take the rear. Fullerton's tank drives ahead as ordered, as the sounds of battle become more and more intense. Through the radio, Sweet is told, Four tanks heading your way. We can't stop them. Thinking quickly, Sweet orders the platoon to stop and his three fully operational tanks to form a wall across the road and aim straight ahead. The enemy are coming. Fullerton takes his position, heartbeat racing. The other pair of Pershings are maneuvering to take their spots beside him when suddenly a fireball of a T-34 rounds the corner before Fullerton's eyes. He gasps and shouts, enemy ahead. Fire! The Pershing's 90mm cannon opens fire with thunderous fury. The shell streaks across the air and strikes the enemy straight on the turret, piercing right through and exiting out of the rear, continuing its path until it impacts into the hill behind. Inside the Pershing, the crew waits for the cloud of dirt picked up by the Pershing's cannon to clear away. Slowly, 
it reveals the enemy T-34, seemingly untouched and still rolling forward. Fullerton shouts, another, just as the loader slams a second high-velocity armor-piercing shell into the breach. The gunner pulls the trigger a second time and the shell slams into the T-34's upper plate, once again cutting straight through the enemy and firing out the rear of the turret. It too impacts the hill behind, making the Marines taking cover on the other side believe that they're under fire. The smoke clears and Fullerton is shocked to see the T-34 still rolling forward. Thinking they had missed, he exclaims, Another! Hit it for God's sake! The Persian fires for a third time, impacting the enemy on their left-hand side. They hit the ammunition and fire immediately pours out of the three points of impact. The Soviet-made machine finally comes to a grinding halt. It's a hit! We got him! Simultaneously, the second Pershing in line maneuvers its way next to Fullerton's tank, just in time for the next T-34-85 to appear from behind the wreck of his comrade. The words, Fire! echo within the American machines, and both Pershings open fire in unison. Two armor-piercing shells slam into the enemy armor, one impacts the T-34's turret cheek, causing it to violently spin around, and the disoriented North Korean gunner fires into the side of the hill. The two American tanks reload, and another volley of shells strikes the enemy, piercing their armor and causing the T-34 to burst into flames. But despite the inferno, the Americans watch incredulous as its turret continues to slowly turn towards them. Load HE! Keep firing! The 90mm weapons continue to shoot round after round, slamming the enemy with four more high-explosive shells, stopping the enemy for good. But then, a radio transmission comes from the Pershings behind. Fullerton, look out, you're on fire! Without him realizing, the gasoline spilled during the refueling had been set alight by an ember from his tank's own cannon. The flame rises above the engine deck and confusion spreads among the crew. But any thought of bailing out is suddenly squashed by a deafening clang reverberating through the Pershing's hull. Fullerton looks through the scope and spots a third T-34-85 firing from behind the smoldering wreckages of his comrades. With the flames behind them pushed to the back of his mind, Fullerton orders, Enemy ahead! Fire! Fire! A second shot from the enemy ricochets off the Pershing's armor before the might of the two 90mm main guns is unleashed once more. The ground quakes as they release their fury, and the T-34-85 is struck down by their shells. Three men immediately jump out of the enemy tank and flee into the darkening landscape, just in time before another deadly volley pierces through their abandoned war machine. The two Pershings continue to lay their fire upon the T-34s, trying to make them burn, while Marines watch in amazement from the other side. The fire that's burning upon the American tanks is repeatedly blown out by their muzzle blasts, only to be reignited by the following shot, making a very confusing sight for the onlooking Marines. Behind the three wrecks, the fourth T-34-85 changes his mind and turns around to flee the scene. But a bazooka squad from the gathered Marines have other plans. They peek over the hill and open fire at its weak side armor, neutralizing it in a single strike. Finally, the order comes for the fire to cease and the battlefield falls silent. Before them lay three burning T-34 85s at the cost of no casualties for the Pershings. Lieutenant Sweet can't help but feel relief. The myth of the T-34 85s invincibility had been spectacularly shattered. Lieutenant Granville Short Sweet would survive the war and return home, and he passed away peacefully in 2010. Technical Sergeant Cecil Roy Fullerton would be awarded the Bronze Star for his actions. He's still alive today, and we hope he likes this film. Thank you for staying with us to the end. We'll be back next week and almost every week with a new film. If you enjoyed this film and you're not yet a subscriber, then please consider pressing the subscribe button. Thank you very much.